okay right so we will be starting the topic and uh, starting from the instruments which are used in the resuscitation so first of that is a self inflating bag which is also known as a ambu bag and ambu bag is basically an acronym for artificial manual breathing unit so ambu is artificial manual breathing unit and uh, as you can see here this is a ambu bag and it basically has an inlet for the oxygen and the air then it has a bag and then there is an outlet so the outlet is uh, where we attach the face mask and this is in turn attached to the patient so the face mask is usually that we use commonly in a pediatric one is a cushion one which can be a circular one or which can be in this shape which is according to the shape of the mouth of the patient then above that there is an expiratory valve unit this is helpful in uh, in the time when the patient is expiring so while you are squeezing you deliver a breath but afterwards when you have released the ambu bag and at that point of time when the patient tries to expire what really happens is that the air doesn't go back instead it gets released from the expiratory valve yeah so here as you can see there is a expiratory valve unit and through which the air gets expired and above that there is a pop up valve so it is a helpful in expiring in uh, releasing whatever extra pressure that you have applied so when you are doing an ambu if you are doing it very aggressively it can be uh, there can be a scenario in which you have uh, pushed a lot of uh, you have pushed the bag with a lot of effort and a too much pressure is being uh, transmitted to the outlet unit but in that case the pop up valve acts as a safety valve and it gets released above a pressure of usually 35 to 40 cm of water so beyond that whatever pressure is being uh, transmitted it gets released and thus it acts as a safety mechanism there is also a peep valve which helps you in giving a cpap uh, in case you connect it externally to a cpap delivering device and then there is a self inflating bag which is of a variable size from 250 ml to 750 ml commonly used in the pediatric age and in a older child in adolescent or adult even a 1000 ml bag is used afterwards there is a inlet which has a air inlet and there is a oxygen inlet so in the oxygen inlet there is a tubing which is attached to the central oxygen supply or to a oxygen cylinder and here is an air inlet where you have a one way valve and there is a reservoir so socket so this is what is a reservoir bag so sometimes uh, we do an ambu and the reservoir is bag is also not connected so this remains as such and at that point of time even if you have connected if you have connected the oxygen in the tubing then also the total concentration that would be delivered would not exceed 40% so that's why the reservoir bag is needed Uh, as we already discussed, the size is 250 to 750 ml, and for an older child, a 1000 ml bag may be required. And that depends on how, uh, when you have checked for the resuscitation, you have to actually achieve a good chest rise. And uh, the oxygen carrying capacity, it can supply up to 90 to 100% oxygen, depending on how, whether you have connected it to oxygen inlet and whether you have connected the reservoir bag. And then, as we discussed, there is a safety feature of a pop-up valve, and the size depends on the appropriately sized mask. as we will discuss so a self inflating bag without an oxygen reservoir as i told if it is connected to an oxygen inlet then also what happens is uh, there is a mixing of room air along with the oxygen which is coming from the central supply so eventually because of the mixing the ultimate oxygen which is getting delivered is only 40% whereas if you connect it to an oxygen reservoir basically what happens is it starts accumulating oxygen which is getting uh, delivered into the bag so ultimately it also acts as a reservoir for oxygen and thus the eventual oxygen concentration that is attained in the bag it reaches to 90 to 100% and thus the patient gets of oxygen which is up to 90 to 100% and there are basically two types of reservoir either it is in a form of a corrugated tube or it is it can be in a form of a bag so you can uh, see both of them in the wards if you come for the ward rounds you will you can find both the ones being used and as i already talked about this pop up valve it is uh, it releases off when there is a pressure which exceeds 30 to 40 cm of water 
Now the face mask can be of a cushioned rim, which is used in uh, the ambu that we do for a newborn or a pediatric patient because it is a less traumatic one and it gets a better fit for a child. And the shape could be a round one or an anatomical one and you have to ensure that there is an appropriate fit before you apply the mask. So what is an appropriate fit for a child? Can anyone tell me whether it, this one is the appropriate one? The, this is the first one, this is the second one, and it's the third one. So according to you, which one is the best fit? So this is the first one and according to you, this is the best fit. The problem here is that the mask you can see in the bottom, it is exceeding the chin. So you should actually not cross the chin because in, if it is not covering the face properly, then the pressure would be released off. So actually the second one is a better fit. In the third one also, it is too small. There can be a place where it can be so large that it can even cover the eyes. So that's also not right. So actually the second one is the best fit among all of them. Now, indications of a bag and mask ventilation is for a uh, pediatric patient, it is either uh, for a respiratory failure due to arising because of any situation. It could be because of COVID like pneumonia or it could be any other pneumonia. It could be asthma, poisoning or in a child who has got a neurogenic failure, neurogenic cause and that has led to a respiratory failure. So the efforts that the child is generating is not sufficient and thus they land up in a type 2 kind of a respiratory failure because the Ventilation is inadequate and thus in uh, this can be seen in a situation like a GBS where the, gradually the respiratory muscles also get involved and eventually the child would start accumulating CO2 and you, for the proper ventilation to take place, you will have to intubate the child. But prior to that, you will do a bag and mask ventilation just to stabilize him for intubation. And in a newborn, as we already know, it, you must have been taught about the newborn resuscitation that after 30 seconds of initial steps, if the child is still not breathing or is gasping or the heart rate is less than 100 per minute, you will do a bag and mask ventilation. And the contraindications are diaphragmatic hernia and even in a case of tracheoesophageal fistula. So uh, what could be the disadvantages of a self-inflating bag? The disadvantages are that usually what happens is that when you have a self-inflating bag, irrespective of whether the seal of the child that you have placed, it doesn't depend that uh, depend on the seal or it doesn't depend on the flow of oxygen. It will inflate on its own. So you will not understand whether there is an adequate seal or not if you use a self-inflating bag. And it also requires a reservoir. As I told you before, that if you do not use a reservoir, then it will not deliver 100% oxygen. And uh, it, uh, it can also not act as a free flow oxygen reliably because if unless you are doing an uh, squeezing, it will not act as a free flow oxygen supply. And uh, normally in a normal one, which is uh, commonly used in a ward, it does not deliver CPAP. And it can only be done when it have applied some special valves in it. And uh, for preparing an equipment, what we do is first we connect the tubings and uh, we connect the oxygen reservoir. We adjust the flow to 5 to 10 liters per minute. And then you check whether the bag is working or not. So for that, what you do is you block the patient outlet with placing the mask on your palm of the hand. And then after properly holding it, you squeeze the bag. And then you try to feel whether the pressure is being generated on your hand or not. And if you are increasing the pressure, whether the pop-off is releasing or not. And after you have done that, at the time you have, after you have squeezed, whether the bag is self-inflating or not. So that's how you check for the adequacy of the equipment. So anytime using, before using a bag, actually this thing should be done every time. And you have to do, check for all the three things. So that's how you do it. You place a uh, mask on your palm, grab it properly. Then you squeeze it and you feel, feel for the pressure. Then you increase the pressure, look at the pop-up wall releasing the pressure. And at the time of it releasing, you see whether it is self-inflating or not. And, uh, and you must have been told in neonatology also, the correct position is to stand at the back of the child, at the head end or on the side, but not in front. So a lot of time in the exam, what you end up doing is you just start doing an ambu, you, when you are told to use it on a mannequin, you just stand in front or any in any awkward position. So you have to first correct the position of the child or your position and you have to show it in the proper manner. 
and then uh, the what is uh, another thing that is really important is that the positioning should be important in the form of the neck position and the head position should be so that uh, if the patient is lying down the there should be a shoulder roll if required so that there should be an alignment between the external auditory meatus of the patient with the sternal notch so that the tube is in uh, the line in a straight line and when you are doing an ambu Uh, when you are doing the bagging you can see the chest being uh, chest rising adequately and then there is a thing called a easy grip so do you know what is an easy grip what do you uh, do in a easy grip there is no way to actually check for it immediately you do not check for it in a case of a diaphragmatic hernia you will have a child who will have a lot of distress and at the same time when you will be doing an auscultation you can hear some gurgling uh, noises in the chest and in the abdomen there would be a scaphoid type of an abdomen so in that case you will strongly suspect it for checking it so definitely you will have to do an x ray but in that case if it has been confirmed obviously you will avoid but even if you have a strong suspicion you should avoid doing an bagging because it will lead to worsening of the scenario and similarly for a t fistula a child might be born with a lot of secretions coming out from the mouth and there would be a suspicion in that case when the child if you are suspecting a t fistula either you have a red rubber catheter or a ng tube and you just insert it and then you get a x ray film taken or uh, and uh, you see it for yourself or if you are suspecting based on the clinical uh, clinical scenario then also you avoid doing it now as i asked uh, what is uh, the ec grip so i think some of you have answered correctly the thumb and the index finger basically makes a c which helps in maintaining the face seal as you can see here and when you are using the rest of the finger it is basically placed on the middle finger is placed on the mandibular symphysis and the ring and the little finger are placed on the angle of the mandible so this is how you make a entire correct positioning so that the proper grip of the mask is maintained and thereafter what are the signs of an effective post op pressure ventilation what happens is when you do it properly first you will see that there would be a correction in the heart rate if the child has a heart rate which is low like in a neonate if it is less than 100 it will start improving there would be a improvement obvious improvement in the color of the child and the tone of the child and on auscultation you will feel see that there is an audible breath sounds on both the sides and the chest is also moving adequately and if this is not happening then you will take ventilation corrective steps in the form of mr sopa we will reapply the mask you will reposition the child you will suction if required again open the mouth reapply the mask and if required you increase the pressure and if all of this fail then you will all uh, go for an alternative airway like a laryngeal mask airway or a et tube now coming to the endotracheal intubation so what are the indications of an endotracheal intubation basically it is uh, required in a neonate all neonate when you have already or even in a uh, children in a, when you have obviously given a bag, ambu bagging you have done for a prolonged period and uh, you have seen that the child has not improved and uh, requires a mechanical ventilation that time you will intubate the child and in case you are doing a bag and mask and because of some issues the patient is not having an adequate chest rise on uh, using that then you will do an endo uh, endotracheal intubation and in other conditions where there is a contraindication like a diaphragmatic hernia in uh, meconium stain and amniotic fluid when you have already uh, uh, confirmed it and you have to do a tracheal suction and uh, sometimes you use uh, endotracheal intubation also for delivering drugs through it tube like in a case of a newborn having a highly membrane disease for uh, delivering a surfactant you can do a transient intubation and you deliver the surfactant and even in uh, resuscitation there is a role for delivering epinephrine then you can deliver drugs other drugs like atropine naloxone lignocaine and obviously when a patient who requires a prolonged uh, uh, mechanical ventilation like a gbs child you have to intubate the child and then there are certain uh, emergency scenarios which arises as like a epiglottitis or a life threatening croup where the child is developing laryngeal edema and uh, uh, the respiration is getting compromised then you will do uh, go for a immediate intubation and if not possible then you will have to go for a tracheostomy so what are the prerequisites for intubation what uh, you have to do is you have to ensure that before starting the patient you have already done uh, positive pressure ventilation and uh, you have given it uh, 100% oxygen and uh, 
you try to deliver a free flow oxygen supply within during the intubation and you do not take more than 20 to 30 seconds during each attempt it's not like if you have tried and the patient is not getting intubated in the first attempt you really have to keep on prolonging the first try itself you have given 20 30 seconds of a trial and if you see that the patient is you are not able to intubate you just again go back to the bag and mask ventilation you give the ventilate the child again you do it properly you ensure that the saturation has risen and then you try again so that's how you should do it. Now coming to the laryngoscope. So how many types of blades are there in a laryngoscope? As you can see, there are two types. Basically, there is a handle. Then there are two types of blade. Either it's a curved one, a Macintosh, or a straight one, that is a Miller one. And uh, then there is a flange. And on that, there is a bulb, which is a source of light supply, which is attached. And inside that, we have a batteries. That's, uh, that's how the electric uh, the light comes from the bulb and during uh, before doing every uh, the procedure you should ensure that you have checked the laryngoscope that the bulb is working and uh, you have chosen the appropriate size blade for the according to the uh, age and the size of the patient so laryngoscope when uh, you use it it is held in the left hand the parts I've already explained and the sizes according to different ages are like for a preterm and a low birth neonate you use a zero size one for a term neonate, it has to be one. And for a child between two to 10 years of age, it will be two years. And for an older child, it can be a three year bit. And uh, the uses, as we have already discussed, for any situation which requires some mechanical ventilation, the intubation, uh, you will use a laryngoscope. And the sterilization is done by autoclaving. Now, coming to the endotracheal tubes. So, there are two types of endotracheal tubes a cuffed one and an uncuffed one. And uncuffed one starts from 2.5, and cuffed ones are used in an older child. So, how, when do you use a cuffed one? It is only preferred in a child who is more than two, more than eight years of age. In the children who are younger, what they have is uh, they have an anatomical narrowing already at the level of the cricoid cartilage, so the tube remains in place and they do not require a another extra extrinsic cuff. The chances of dislocation is less in them. And uh, when you do a in, when you are used the cuff and you are using a cuffed endotracheal tube, what you should ensure is when you have done an inflation, there still should be an audible air leak present when you are using at a pressure of 20 to 30 centimeter of water. So what are the parts of an endotracheal tube? So initially there would be in the proximal part, you will find an adapter uh, through which you connect it to an ambu bag or you connect it to a ventilator. And then there is a tubing which has a vocal cord guide so why is this used it is used for a proper placement so when you are doing an intubation it should be placed at the level of the opening of the vocal cord so while intubating you will be able to see the vocal cords and here you will uh, place the uh, the tube so that the line lies at that level and then there's a radio opaque marker which helps you in the proper visualization of the position of the AK tube. So after you have done any endotracheal intubation, what is a free, uh, what is an absolute thing is to ensure the proper positioning. Do you do an X-ray to just ensure that it is lying at the right place? And then there is a distance indicator. So that shows how what length we have inserted. And according to the age and the weight of the child, it also differs. So uh, that is there. And if there you have a cuffed one, you will have a cuff in a plain one that's not there. And at the distal one, there are two things. One is a natural opening, which has a pivot in the end. And then uh, there is a Murphy eye, which has been placed. And it helps in the proper, uh, so that the secretions or whatever is coming, it gets expelled. And the AG tube doesn't get, blog so that's an additional uh, opening that is there and uh, what are the sizes so for a uncuffed endotracheal tube and for a uh, for a, initially for an infant and neonate it depends on the weight of the child so if you have a child who's less than one kg then you will use an uncuffed one of a 2.5 size and between one to two kgs it would be three for two to three it would be 3.5 and for more than three kg child it would be 3.5 to four any of these you can use and similarly for a gestational age you will uh, be you should know the tube sizes that is to be used in that child and for an older child like who is between uh, one to eight years of age and you have to use according to the age of the child so what you will do is for an uncuffed one, the formula would be four plus age by four and for a cuffed one like you used in a child who is more than eight years the formula would become 3.5 plus age by four so that's what would be required for knowing the exact tube size and then the depth of insertion would be either age in years which is divided by 4 plus 12 
and or the internal diameter of the tube multiplied by three. So that's a rough approximation. But when you are doing an incubation, at that point of time, also you decide the depth depending on the size, location of the vocal cord. And after you have inserted, you will check for the position and according to the air entry on the both side. That time also you manipulate. So that's how you keep the child. The neck should be slightly extended so that the line of sight should be clear and uh, then at that point of time you will do the in uh, you will uh, put the endotracheal uh, you will put the use the laryngoscope and you will uh, lift it should be lifted in this direction so you are holding it like that and then you are lifting it like that so whoever is performing initially should be standing at the head end of the patient and then it should be extending the neck of the patient according in the appropriate manner and uh, then the laryngoscope is held in the left hand so that uh, the glottis is properly visualized from the right side and then you uh, try to insert the tip of the blade between the tongue and the epiglottis and then you lift it upwards and away from himself okay so this is really important when you are doing an intubation it should not be like a to and fro movement so that uh, the child does not end up, end up having trauma to the mouth or the teeth so the position of doing the proper way of doing it like that you have inserted it and then you are lifting it upwards and then uh, when that is done and you can visualize the vocal cord, then you insert the endotracheal tube. And that uh, at the time of inserting the endotracheal tube, you will insert it from, uh, you will you hold it in the right hand and then you will insert it from the right side of the mouth because on the left side, you have placed the laryngoscope blade and the glottis is being properly visualized. So you will start inserting it from the right end and uh, you will keep inserting at the point where you see that the vocal cord guide is located at the level of the vocal cord. And... Uh, at the time of insertion, what you really need to see is that the vocal cords are opening. Sometimes transiently, the patient holds the breath and that time the vocal cords would be approximated. So in that scenario, do not try to push it. Rather, what you can do is actually stop doing the intubation, start doing bagging and again give another try after like 20-30 seconds of doing a bag and mask ventilation. So it should never rush. And if you find that the vocal cords are not separating, you will do a bag and mask ventilation and then try it again. Then after doing an intubation, the next important thing is to check the placement. So the placement is checked by doing a ambu, uh, by doing a bag and mask ventilation through the AD tube. So what will you see? You will check for the air entry on the both sides and uh, you will at the same time also auscultate over the abdomen so that you see that the air is, the, the tube has inserted in the trachea and not in the esophagus. And uh, what are the signs that the tube has been inserted in the esophagus? The most important is that the child would not improve. In fact, it can start deteriorating even rapidly. He will become even more sinus, may develop bradycardia. And if you have a CO2 detector there, when you connect it to the ET tube, it will show that there is no, uh, there, uh, there will be no expired CO2 because it's not coming from the trachea. And on auscultation, there would be no uh, uh, audible breath sound in the chest. Rather, you'll hear a breath sound in the stomach. And if you do it for a, a while, the abdomen also starts descending and you will find a gastric distension. Now, very common thing that we also commonly use is at the time when you have inserted it, immediately you will find that the mist has started developing in the tube. That's like a very quick thing to note. So when, once you see mist properly forming, then you are like sort of ensured that the tube has been inserted into the trachea. Whereas if it has gone into the esophagus, there would be no mist formation. And obviously there would be no proper chest rise. And if the tube has gone very far into one side of the trachea or into the trachea, what really happens is it will block the other side of the bronchus. So the child might not develop a good improvement. There might be some improvement or no improvement. And then on auscultation, the breath sound would be located on one side. That is mostly it goes to the right side and there would be no air entry on the left side. And you will have really clear uh, breath sounds on right side and no air entry on the left or very minimal air, uh, air entry on the left side. And coming to the complication. So what is the complication? The complication of any procedure can be if you don't do it in a rush, they can produce a mechanical injury. So there would be an injury to the tissues that you get on the path. That is it. There could be a problem in the lips, in the teeth, in the tongue, the palate. Anything can get damaged if you do it in a rush, in a hush-hush manner. And uh, 
if you do it in improperly and you use a bigger size tube or you use a large size uh, laryngoscope that is a larger size blade what you will end up doing is you will start you will stimulate the posterior pharyngeal wall that is what we really want to prevent by using a appropriate size blade of the laryngoscope and when that happens the patient uh, the patient will develop a vasovagal episode and which will lead to a hypoxia or bradycardia child can even go into a arrest in that case and uh, that's really uh, why you should be very cautious in choosing the right sort of blade right side of the blade and uh, the hyperextension should be avoided and if you are doing it in a hurry and you have hyperextended the neck and you have done it in a very uh, in a bad manner you can even end up doing the damage to the cervical spine now coming to another device that is uh, tps resuscitator so this is like a tps not a resuscitator tps so tps is basically a t shaped tubing and uh, it is connected to an endotracheal tube and it is used to deliver oxygen therapy when the patient is on intubated and who does not require mechanical ventilation so it is often used to do a spontaneous breathing trial so you are already uh, trying to wean a patient off from the ventilator so what you do is you disconnect from the mechanical ventilator and you place the patient on tps and then you observe whether the child is being able to sustain or not so in the patient who is uh, able to sustain his spontaneous breath and is maintaining the saturation and vitals on that then that patient can be taken off from the ventilator and uh, then coming to the next topic that is the oxygen delivery devices so uh, we will be discussing in brief about these because i think there would be other lectures in that it would be covered in detail so uh, there would be uh, there are two types of oxygen delivery devices one is a low flow one which constitute of the nasal prong the nasal catheter and the nasopharyngeal catheter and it can be also of a high flow type which is the face mask a head box or a, a incubator and a tent so nasal prongs are commonly used in ward so when you will go to the ward you will find one or the other child on a nasal prong these are soft twin nasal prongs it has uh, in these are in the form of uh, twin prongs which are inserted according to the side of the child and it is inserted in the anterior nair and oxygen is delivered and it's of both the adult and pediatric size and uh, the oxygen which is administered is usually of 2 to 4 liters per minute and it gives us fio2 of up to 30 to 40% the advantage the biggest advantage is that once the child does not require a lot of oxygen you can use less of a flow and the child would be maintaining the saturation and then the child's mouth would be free and you can easily start initiate feeding and you do not have to remove oxygen mask each uh, every time that you have to give feed to the child and it is also used in delivering cpap and uh, a disadvantage is that if you do not use it properly and you insert it very tightly then there can be an injury to the nasal mucosa then another device is a nasal cannula and uh, it is also inserted uh, from the side of the nostril to the inner margin of the eyebrow so this is like uh, also not going too too much of a depth it is only from the nostril to the inner margin of the eyebrow and uh, it only reaches to the back of the nasal cavity and uh, sometimes when a proper one nasal cannula is not available we can even use a normal nasogastric tube for this procedure then another process is a nasopharyngeal catheter here the lens would be from the side of the nose to the tragus of the ear so here it would be further deeper and so much so that the tip of the catheter is usually visible below even the soft palate and in the neonate and the infant and the 6 to size french catheter is used now this is a simple face mask that you will commonly see in ward it is a basic reservoir system and here the flow would be of 5 to 12 liters per minute the saturation that i fio to that is maintained on uh, a simple face mask is between 35 to 50% and the flow rate that you give it should exceed 5 liter per minute why because if you will, it will not be of a sufficient flow then whatever exhaled gases that the child is exhaling it will not be flushed off and it start accumulating and the child would end up inhaling the exhaled air so the flow rate has to be more than 5 liters per minute and uh, what are the advantages obviously it's a quick method it's easy to apply it's disposable inexpensive and uh, 
it is easily used in a patient who has some localized irritation when there is some trauma to the nose or something you cannot use a nasal prong there because the child might be having more pain when you apply a nasal prong or a nasal catheter and the disadvantages are that uh, because of the bigger size it's a bit uncomfortable and you have to be removed every time you have to uh, the patient has to be fed and uh, when the child is having a vomiting or something then it it becomes another problem and uh, it is usually preferred for emergencies and when you have to use it for a shorter period of time now coming to the partial rebreathing mask or a non rebreathing mask so they both look the same is so that there would be some difference in the use of valves in them and uh, they have a 1 liter flexible reservoir attached to them so a face mask doesn't have that a simple face mask doesn't have a reservoir bag but the one which has a balloon shaped reservoir bag is either a partial rebreathing mask or a non rebreathing mask and uh, because of the presence of the reservoir the fio2 that is being delivered would be higher so a non rebreathing mask uh, is also commonly used now especially during the covid pandemic we have actually used it a lot and it is a closed system and it helps in blending a premix air and oxygen and a full range of fio2 even up to 90 to 100% is being delivered through this and uh, whatever is coming is a warmed and humidified gas mixture and it flows into a inspiratory volume reservoir and uh, then the patient breathes through the closed airway appliance such as a mask with one way valve so this is a non rebreathing mask that we commonly use here there would be a reservoir bag and um, besides these there are high flow venturi mask and uh, these are of different different colors so depending on the color there would be different fio2 and different flow rate so the fio2 that is being delivered depends on their construction different different are have different sort of aperture and depending on that the flow rate also will change the flow rate and depending on that the fio2 that is being delivered to the patient also changes so and uh, what are the advantages of uh, using this is that it delivers a predictable fio2 in a non rebreathing mask or in a simple face mask you can only assume that a certain fio2 is being delivered but here in a venturi mask you know that precisely depending on which color you choose what fio2 am i delivering the limitation is like a face mask it is like there would be a difficulty in eating drinking or in expectoration or vomiting the patient might feel a bit of a claustrophobia and because of uh, high flow rates being used there can be irritation to the eyes also now this is something that is commonly used in neonates or a small infant this is called an oxygen hood and uh, the pass are an oxygen inlet is there and the top a nozzle is there and there is a port hole through which the head of the child is inserted and uh, the advantages of this is that it is a very convenient non invasive method you just have to keep the patient on the bed and you have to put it on the top ensuring that the neck of the child is not getting compressed so that's what you use adequate size one depending on the size of the child and it helps in giving very non invasive comfortable oxygen to the child and allows the humidification of oxygen but the disadvantages are that you require a high flow here so if the flow is insufficient and uh, uh, then what happens is that the expired air doesn't get ex uh, removed and in exhaled air doesn't get removed and then the child might start developing uh, uh, as inspiration of may might start inspiring the exhaled gases so we have to keep a high flow and in the patient which has a poor respiratory effort in that case none of these methods actually work so there you will have to do assisted ventilation so similarly for this uh, oxygen head box also when a patient has a poor respiratory drive you cannot use it and uh, similarly there would be difficulty in feeding the child might feel claustrophobic might get irritable and a lot of children actually do not tolerate it and has to be put on some other method like a oxygen mask or a nasal prong Uh, but in a neonate is actually quite comfortably used now coming to another topic that is a suction catheter so this is a common suction catheter that is used in the ward it has a open tip in the end and it has two lateral eyes which help which will help in suctioning the secretions and uh, the length is usually 52 cm and it is color coded and depending on the age of the child the catheter size varies the sizes are given in any standard book so you can uh, before putting uh, before inserting a suction catheter actually you have to go and check the correct size you should check the correct size for the age of the child and also the suction pressure depends on the age of the infant uh, 
in uh, age of the child. So if it is a neonate, the pressure is usually kept between a 60 to 80 mmHg. And for as a child grows in an infant, it can be up to 100. And for our older children, it can go up to 120 mmHg. Now, how do you insert it? So for a nasopharyngeal one, basically the measurement is from the tip of the nose to the bottom of the ear lobe. And for a oropharyngeal one, the length is from the incisor to the angle of the jaw. And you can even go further three centimeters so that you properly suction it. And another thing that is commonly asked in exams in your table Y valve is which is to be suctioned first. So which will you suction first? Why do we suction the mouth first? Whatever oxygen we are giving, it is all humidified oxygen. So we suction the mouth first because when you are doing a nasopharyngeal suction, the patient might develop the, um, might actually aspirate the uh, secretion that is lying in the mouth. So you have to ensure that he doesn't end up choking on his own secretion, which is there in the mouth. So you first do the suction of the mouth and then only you will do the suction of the nose. And uh, the complication of this procedure is that the patient might develop, a, uh, during the procedure, the patient might develop a hypoxia. So that's why what is really important is the suction should not be of more than 10 seconds. So anytime that you are doing a suction, you have to ensure that you do not end up doing it for prolonged periods. It has to be of uh, 10 seconds duration. And uh, how do you do it is, uh, I'm not going to explain all the procedures in detail because there is a lack of time and we have to cover all the instruments. So there, there can be, whenever you are doing a class with your senior residents or something, you can actually ask for a demonstration of the different procedures. Here we will be talking briefly about the procedures, if at all, and the depth and the procedures in detail uh, should be discussed actually in a SR demonstration class. So for a naso, uh, for a suction catheter, you apply some lubricant, usually we use with INS, and then you insert according to the measurement. So while doing the process, what do you really need to know is while inserting, you do not apply the suction. The suction is applied when you are actually pulling it back and you slowly pull it back in a circular motion. So that's what, the suction should be applied in a proper manner. And if you do it while inserting and all, you can end up traumatizing the mucosa of the child. And, uh, uh, the that's that's the way you end up preventing the hypoxia and you end up preventing the damage to the nasal mucosa. Bradycardia also happens because if you do it uh, in a manner that you end up pushing it too much inside, you will end up doing a vasovagal stimulation. And uh, an infection can be there if you do not follow follow a strict aseptic precautions before doing the procedure. Now coming to another device which is a mucus extractor. So this is also known as a Dini's mucus extractor. And uh, uh, this is, it can be used for either a suctioning thing or it can be even used for collecting secretions so that it can be sent for a sample. So like when you are doing a bronchoscopy or something, that time for collection, collecting the bile aspirate and all, you can also use it. So it has a chamber where you can actually collect the secretion. And then one of the end is connected to the suction device and another end is connected to the patient. So, uh, and there is uh, an advantage uh, in a scenario where you have do not have a suction machine available in uh, in a periphery or somewhere where you do not have a suction machine. It can be actually held in the mouth and with the inspiratory pressure, you can generate a suction. So it's an atraumatic one and it has a soft and rounded open tip. And it also has to lateralize for the same reason that the secretion gets suctioned. And then there would be a transparent container that collects the secretion. And the capacity of this is 25 ml. And the pressure would also depend on the suction and delivery device that you connect it to. So it should be maintained between 80 to 100 mmHg. And the users can be both diagnostic and therapeutic. Now, this is what you commonly see, and you must be see, seeing this in the, even the surgeries and everywhere where, where they're used while you have uh, been, where the patient is put for uh, anesthesia. So, it is a good airway, and it is a nasopharyngeal airway device, and it helps in maintaining an unobstructed respiration when uh, the patient has been either comatose or has, is in anesthesia because it helps in preventing the tongue from falling back. 
and uh, it is made in a such a manner that it do not have any sharp any sharp edges it's surrounded atraumatic edges are there and uh, in a patient who is very agitated and irritable is biting the tongue that time you can also use it to prevent uh, prevent the uh, patient from biting his tongue and maintaining the airway at the same time and it is a color coded one and uh, depending on the size of the patient uh, depending on uh, the distance that you have measured from the angle of the mouth to the uh, tragus that uh, color changes and uh, how do you insert it initially it is inserted in this manner that you insert like this and then you turn it so that eventually it lies over the tongue and it keeps the tongue from falling it prevents the tongue from falling and uh, this as i already told it has different different color and it depends on the size of the patient now coming briefly to mdi with spaces uh, again it would be discussed in a class on i think asthma so we will be discussing it briefly so basically this is a spacer and this is a metered dose inhaler and the common drug that we use it for our beta 2 agonist ciprotropium the steroids that we use with mdis and uh, it is used in a case of asthma and it can also be used for uh, patients who have walry that is we use associated lower respiratory infections and advantages are definitely that it's really portable easy to carry and helpful in delivering a precise constant dose but the research advantage is that if you do not use it with a spacer then that becomes really difficult because hand breath coordination is a thing that is like even difficult to achieve in adult so it is even more difficult in a child now coming to the pressurized meter dose inhaler it has the following parts there is a canister and then there is a drug propellant suspension which has the drug in it and then there is a mouthpiece and a metering valve so the canister is uh, has a propellant drug mixture which is used in the liquid form initially and then there are metering valves in the end which deliver a precise aerosol amount and depending on the aperture actually the spray pattern and emitted particle size varies so that depends on the diameter of the actuator orifice and the expansion chamber i think in the classes that you have on asthma these would be discussed in further detail and uh, the newer actuator that is the plastic covering in the newer ones you even have dose counters so the ones where there are 200 doses it will start with a mark which will in, uh, reveal how many doses are being used in them and what is actually left so how do you use it initially what you do is you remove the cap and you shake the inhaler properly for 5 seconds then the uh, the child is asked to breathe out all the way then the patient is asked to breathe in and the inhaler is placed in the mouth between the teeth and the mouth is closed and when the patient starts to breathe in slowly you press the top of the inhaler and he is asked to keep on breathing in slowly so that the entire content goes into the lung and after it is done inhaler is withdrawn from the mouth and then you ask the patient to hold the breath for 10 seconds so that it stays in the mouth and doesn't gets exhaled and then the patient is asked to breathe out so obviously as you can see that the process is a bit complicated especially for a child and uh, again after the, uh, you are done with the procedure please replace the cap and uh, what is important is between two uh, puffs that you are taking it should not be immediately there should be a gap of at least 30 seconds to 1 minute before you are taking two puffs so what we do in a pediatric patient and even in adults is preferable is to use a spacer so when you use a inhaler alone it will end up delivering the medicine in the mouth the throat tongue and lungs so it gets wasted whereas when you use it with a spacer device it is usually delivered very uniformly and more medicines are delivered to the lung so that's the use of a spacer device and uh, there are basically two types of spacer devices a uh, bar spacer device that is a large volume one or a small volume one the larger one helps in a greater delivery of uh, drug but in pediatric we prefer using a smaller one and uh, the volume which is more than 1 liter is obviously not preferred because it will lead to a lot of wastes so how do you use it first you will shake the medicine properly then you insert the mouthpiece of the inhaler into the rubber seal end of the spacer so there would be two end one end would be for the insertion of the mdi and the other end would be the one where the child would take the spacer in his mouth and then once the patient has taken the spacer in the mouth breathe all the air out of your lung that is you ask the child to exhale you put the spacer into the mouth between the teeth and then you make a tight seal around the mouth with your lips and then it is 
the meter dose inhaler is pressed down so initially this is connected then the patient exhales then the patient takes the spacer in the mouth and holds it properly between the mouth and the teeth and once you are comfortable with the child is comfortably holding it in the mouth you simply press the uh, inhaler and the spray is released in the spacer now there will be no need for actually uh, coordinating the breath of the child the child can be asked to breathe in slowly and deeply so at the time of actually uh, compressing in you do not really have to act, uh, coordinate with the as uh, with the breathing of the child the child is asked to simply breathe comfortably slowly and deeply and um, when you have you have a very small child then you actually attach it even with a face mask so it, it is also done the, in a similar manner the you shake the buffer bell and then you insert it into the formal uh, insert it into the spacer and then the mask is placed on the child which covers the mouth and nose properly then the child is asked to breathe out properly and then the of uh, the inhaler is pressed and then the child is asked to breathe comfortably four to five times so similar to uh, uh, simply using a spacer just the added advantage is that the child would not be able to hold in a smaller child they would not be able to hold it properly in the mouth so we have a mask instead and that is placed formally on the face then there are nebulizers which also deliver the uh, medications in the form of mist and those are of two types either it is a gel compressor one or a ultrasonic nebulizer and uh, within uh, uh, when you have started the nebulization there would be a immediate response and uh, this is a nebulization chamber that you commonly see being used it is used for delivering nebulizing beta agonist and uh, it is specially used in a case of an acute exacerbation so if you have uh, a patient who has come to you with an acute exacerbation obviously they will not be carrying their mdi it's most of the time they do not uh, have a controller medication with them so you immediately put them on a nebulization and for that you use a nebulization chamber and the dose that i have mentioned it is of salbutamol basically so you give the salbutamol in a dose of 0.15 mg per kg and you give it at the you, know, you give repeated dosing at 0 20 and 40 minutes for the immediate management of an acute exacerbation and depending on the response then you gradually prolong the interval between the nebulization so frequency is gradually increases as the response as the child responds but initially it is done thrice at an interval of 20 20 minutes and the optimal amount that should be there in the chamber should be three to five ml so that adequate amount of mist can be generated and whenever you are using it you must ensure that after you have put the medication inside you should check that the patient is getting adequate mist or not sometimes it is defective and despite putting adequate volume and everything there would be no mist that is being formed so you have to change the device in that case and it actually leads to a lot of wastage of the drug delivery there would be a delivery of up to 5 to 10 percent and uh, however it's really helpful in a case of an emergency now coming to an infant feeding tube so the infant feeding tube is uh, you will when you come to a ward you will definitely have some children who are on infant feeding tube and it has variable sizes ranging from 5 to 10 and it also has a close uh, it has a proximal one proximal end and there is a distal end so at the distal end there would be two lateral eyes here and uh, this would be closed and there would be a soft and rounded tip which will there too this is rounded because once you are inserting it is going into the stomach so you do not want to traumatize the stomach so it is in a soft and a rounded form and uh, it has a radio opaque line because uh, when you do an x-ray to look at the position you have to ensure that it is in a proper position and that's why we have put on uh, the they have put a radio opaque line for that and the proximal end is then connected to uh, if you are to feed the child you can even use a syringe and from that you whatever medications or whatever feed that you have to go give it is given through that now how do you measure the length for putting a uh, nasogastric tube it is done in uh, initially we'll measure the length from the nostril to the tragus so the nostril to the tragus the length is measured and then from here it is measured till the point of the siphi sternum and then you mark it either you put a um, pen a mark with a pen or you mark it in uh, uh, this place and then you insert the tube in the mouth and once you have inserted it then you check for the position of the tube so 
after inserting you will do an auscultation by pushing air inside and you will hear a gurgling sound in the stomach that's how you confirm the position of the tube and then obviously you will do an x-ray to look at the exact size that has um, whether the where the tube has reached and uh, what are the uses are to do a feeding aspiration and uh, even in uh, in the case of uh, uh, a new need of resuscitation when you are doing a PPB for a prolonged time it is recommended because during the process of bagging the patient will start accumulating air in the stomach and that will hamper the respiration so when the bag and mask ventilation is prolonged you will do an azogastric tube insertion it can be used for gastric lavage for collecting samples like a GL sample is collected for doing a CBNR testing in a case of suspected TB uh, and then diagnostic procedure it can be done to confirm that there is a presence of one latricia that uh, the tube is placed in the uh, in the nose and then it will not go beyond a certain point and then similarly it can confirm a tracheoesophageal fistula or a n latricia and uh, for the diagnosing of internal bleeding it can be used because once you have inserted you will actually aspirate and you will find that blood is coming from the uh, from the GI tract and it will also be it can be used at the same time for doing a lavage and in clearing the secretions from uh, the stomach in case of poisonings in the case of gastric aspirate is specially used for a chemical analysis so when a child has developed a poisoning you do a gastric aspirate and then you send the sample for a chemical analysis now coming to the next procedure that is a lumbar puncture so lumbar puncture is done either for a diagnostic purpose that is in cases of CNS infection like meningitis, meningoencephalitis, encephalitis or to diagnose conditions like subarachnoid hemorrhage or the pseudotumor cerebri or for some other inflammatory CNS diseases like a Gianbury syndrome. So in that would be the diagnostic indication and then for therapeutic indication you do it when you have to do an installation of an intrathecal drug like a methotrexate for chemotherapy and it can be also used for measurement of CSF pressure and when you commonly that is being used in the case of uh, surgery that you use it for a spinal anesthesia. Now the LP needle it is uh, a sterile LP needle which is used with a stellate and uh, the sizes differ according to the age of the child I'm rushing because we do not have a lot of time left and the site is usually in the third or the fourth but intervertebral space and uh, that's where you insert it and uh, the contraindications are a raised ICP whenever the child is having features of raised ICP you should not do it immediately rather you should first manage the intracranial pressure because if you will end up uh, doing it uh, there would be a sudden uh, decrease in the pressure and it can lead to herniation and then a patient who has a severe distress or is in a shock is that the patient is so hemodynamically unstable that uh, you should be avoiding it because in that case in the process of doing it the child can go into an arrest and then there are indications uh, contraindications like thrombocytopenia and if there is a localized infection at the site so in that case also you should not do it because you will end up if you do it you will uh, have a risk of introducing uh, infection into the spinal tract and can have meningitis now complications usually the most common ones are either pain at the local site or the pain uh, or a headache and sometimes if you do not do it properly you can end up having a hydrogenic meningitis and then as i told it you can have a cerebral herniation if you do it in a patient who has raised icp then in a rare scenario this is not a common one sometimes you would do it and a tract forms and you can have a persistent csf leaking and the common other reason uh, other complication could be that during the process of doing it a lot of time it becomes traumatic and you can have a, actually you can end up injuring the structures on the way that is some vessel or nerve or the intervertebral disc might get injured now bone marrow aspiration the indications are diagnostic to uh, diagnose conditions like leukemias lymphomas infiltration in other conditions like other hematological malignancy and um, in conditions such as a storage disorder and uh, also sometimes bone marrow cultures are done in diseases like typhoid and malaria and in some condition like an ITB where you have to start steroid you actually have to rule out malignancy so you end up doing a bone marrow aspiration and uh, the contraindication being infection at the site and the complications are pain at the biopsy site infection and bleeding so these are the common complications so what is this this is a SARS bone marrow aspiration needle so it has three parts in it 
there would be a stilet then there would be a body with a nail and there would be a guard so guard is placed so that you do not end up doing inserting it rapidly and causing trauma to the bone and the other structures nearby and the common structure sites are posterior superior iliac spine or you do it at the sternum and a tibia so in a child who is less than 2 years of age the preferred side is the upper third of the medial aspect of the shaft of the tibia and the child who is more than 2 years of age in that kid you will prefer it at the posterior superior iliac spine and if that cannot be used then manubrium sternae can also be used and uh, this is the bone marrow biopsy needle which is also known as a jamshiri trifine biopsy the other uh, there are like uh, the same needle can be there of different different shapes so there can be one which is of this shape or there can be one which looks like this so you uh, whenever you come for a ward round you can ask them to actually demonstrate the ones that we have here and uh, this has a tapered end and the uh, in the distal portion because it helps in retaining the specimen and as i told this is done at the desired site whether it is posterior superior iliac spine or a tibia and uh, it is specially indicated when you have done a bone marrow aspiration and there is a dry tap and uh, you are suspecting aplastic anemia and then a myelofibrosis and it can it is also done in case of malignancy also to get a proper sample now coming to a liver biopsy so there are different types of needle that are used the ones that we commonly are asked to identify an exam is a wilm silverman needle the other ones are two cut needle or mengeni needle and the wilm silverman needle has a trocar it has a cannula and has a bifid needle and the uses are liver biopsy and it can also be used for kidney biopsy now this is the one that we also have in our uh, we also use is a semi automatic bar biopsy gun and it is also used for both renal and liver biopsy it is of different different sizes varying from 14 to 20 gauze and a 16 one a 16 gauze needle is used in generally older patients like for adolescent or adults whereas for uh, children we preferably we preferably use a 18 gauze one now the indications for liver biopsy and the prerequisites these you can read at home similarly for renal biopsy the indications are all given in the book so it's either nephrotic syndrome there are certain indications like if it is where you are strongly suspecting a significant lesion that is when the child is less than one year or more than 10 years there is a steroid resistance or the patient is on calcium urine inhibitor for a prolonged time to look at nephrotoxicity and in conditions like acute luminal nephritis when the child has rpg and or a delayed resolution even for systemic diseases and then there are conditions which has led to an acute renal failure and you want to not know the etiology just to look for the etiology you will do the renal biopsy the contraindications are that if you, the child has a uncontrolled hypertension or if you have a breathing disorder then you do not do it similarly these are also a related contraindication that the patient if he has only a solitary kidney then uh, it should be avoided and if a patient obviously has an active uti or a pyelonephritis you will not do a renal biopsy and the complication would be hemorrhage infection a fistula formation and uh, because of sedation the child can even have hypoxia or airway compromise so these are the complication of the procedure then uh, this is a tuberculin syringe which is a 1 cc syringe and uh, commonly used for giving or uh, doing a mantu test or to administer a bcg vaccine and it can also be used for delivering test doses of drugs like penicillin or a provocative testing and it is only having a 1 ml size now there are different different sizes of iv cannula these are commonly used in what you should come and see them the ones that we use in pediatric are usually a yellow colored one or a blue colored one even a violet colored one is used in especially in neonates so these are 24 gauze or 22 gauze and uh, they have a thin plastic sheath and in, uh, there is a metallic stilet so when you are inserting the metallic stilet has a needle tip at the end through which it is inserted and once you are in the vein you remove the stilet and then the plastic sheath lies inside the vein and then you fix it properly and it is always we use for doing any puncture for drugs infusion blood for giving antibiotics for giving iv fluids and the common sites are variable from hand to foot we are commonly try to use it in a distal part and when not fails then only we go for uh, doing a puncture at a major vein like an anticubital cephalic basal or median cubital veins preferably either the dorsum of hand especially the non dominant hand should be preferred so that it does not interfere with the use of the hand or if the foot is preferred 
Now this is a scalvein needle, which has a metallic needle at the end, which is connected to a plastic tubing, and it has a butterfly-shaped structure which acts as a holder, and you fix it here. And the common ones used in pediatric is 22 to 24 end, and similarly, it is also done for use for the same purpose like a IV cannula. This is how you insert it. And then this is an IV set that you use after you have put a inserted a cannula. Then you attach the medi uh, I, uh, the medication bottle to the cannula through this. That is, it has a cannula in the end which is inserted in the IV bottle. It has a plastic tubing. This is the Murphy's chamber which helps us in regulating the speed of the IV drip. And then there is a connector which through which you connect it to the IV cannula. Uh, the other device which we use commonly in pediatrics is a PDR drip set or a micro drip set. This is further helpful because in children you will need small amount of infusion. So this has a holding capacity of 100 ml and it gives you micro drips. So the drop size would be of 60 drops per ml and uh, the burette chamber is there which will help in uh, the burette chamber is there which helps for infusion of all types of fluid. There is a hanger. Uh, which is there for uh, hanging the tube, for hanging the drip set. And then there is a floating valve. This helps as a indicator that there is a proper uh, fluid that is there and it is uh, automatically after the fluid is, once the infusion has stopped, it automatically shuts off the drain. It goes to the bottom and it locks it. So it prevents the air from going into the line. And then there are roller controller which provides accurate flow control. This is a three-way connector that is also commonly used when you have to connect several, you have only one access and you want to give IV fluids and medication at the same time, then you can use it. And the other indications are you use it in the exchange transfusion, in PD or in a cytic or pleuritic path. Urinary catheters, you must be uh, talking about these in the surgery, so I wouldn't be descri describing in detail. There is a Foley's catheter which is commonly used in pediatrics and it has a Self-retaining catheter, it has a balloon at the end which is inflated with the help of a saline. We do not use air because it can lead to infection or embolism. And the uses are diagnostic either for collection of urine specimen for correct accurate measurement of the urine output in case of patient is on renal failure or in shock and also used for urodynamic studies. And therapeutically we use it to relieve the urinary retention for bladder irrigation and for doing an intermittent decompression in cases of neurogenic bladder. Then the final slide that is there, this is a urinary bag. So this is a disposable plastic bag, which is marked in milliliters. So you have to actually connect it and then you have to monitor the collection by chain. Actually the position is changed so that the fluid volume gets accumulated here. The urine gets accumulated in this form and then you read it. So initially you read like this and then you read like this. After this is filled up, more than that, you start reading from here. And it has, uh, uh, it is, has a closed upper end and a plastic tube opening into it. So the plastic tube enters here. This end is connected to the police catheter or whatever catheter is there. And there is a non-return valve at the insertion point so that after the tube has inserted here, it uh, the whatever content is there in the bag doesn't go back. And uh, that's, that's the end of this topic. Thank you for the patient listening. And uh, I'm sorry because I was in a bit of a hurry. I wasn't able to take a lot of your questions. So what you can do is you can ask me in person whenever you are there in the world. Can you kindly share the presentation? You will be getting a write-up. Please, I said, we have high opening pressure. Actually, when you are doing it and you have missed a case of raised ICP, at that point of time, once you have inserted it, then you you will end up finding a raised pressure that the fluid will come with a lot of gush. Sometimes, very rarely, it can be used in a controlled manner to actually release pressure. But at your end, you only need to know that a condition like a raised ICP is a contraindication for doing a lumbar puncture. So for your understanding, a raised ICP 
is an absolute contraindication and if at all you end up doing it there would be a sudden release of pressure there would be a high pressure through which the fluid will start coming and it will lead to a risk of herniation okay thank you